Hello everyone and welcome to this new interview of Kuba Plus and with uh, Sovereign University. This time I have the chance to be with uh, Jose from Ibex. Jose, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So uh, at Kuba Plus we're trying to train uh, new Salvadorian kids to become Lightning Dev. At the university we try to teach everyone about Lightning and Bitcoin. Maybe for the one that don't know what Ibex is and what you do, could you please introduce yourself a bit? Absolutely. I'm the CEO and founder of Ibex, we uh, started off as an OTC market uh, back in 2019, really. Um, now we've pivoted and we are an infrastructure as a services company and we deliver lightning technology to our customers so that they can uh, integrate uh, lightning very easily into their products and services and start you know, leveraging the power of this uh, technology. Yeah, I was uh, looking at all the services you're offering now as a, a lightning service provider. So you have payment, you have an infrastructure, like where, where are you uh, trying to aim more than match, margin adoption or really like corporation level uh, of services? It's corporation level of services. And by corporation, we, you know, we try to shy away a little bit from that term because we're very pro startup. So we know a lot of the innovation in the space is going to come from you know, new entrants, not necessarily people that ha have been entrenched and are used to doing things a certain way, but, you know, um, those entrepreneurs that have no baggage, that just see, you know, what needs to be fixed and they are interested in building tools that fix it. Yeah, it's funny, you're talking about startup. Ibex is no more of a startup. It's actually a pretty uh, good company. Well, <laughs> no, we, we're still, you know, in that startup uh, uh, phase I would consider us definitely you know we're still raising capital and yeah so so I think we're still in that <laughs> position and so having been in, been in the place for so long and having seen lightning grow over the years mm -hmm. um, what's your current uh, idea of the state of lightning as, a, as of today I think it's it's good it's very promising obviously you know we still have a lot of uh, things to to still build out. There's a lot of functionality that's missing. There's certain maturity that we have to, you know, gain as, you know, both at technology, but also businesses that operate in Lightning, um, just from the operational standpoint as well. So I would classify as, uh, you know, I actually got this question not too long ago, like, you know, where in the life cycle we are. I think we're, if we were to match it to uh, um, a human lifespan, I would say early teens, but like just barely, like, you know, 12, 13, <laughs> in that range. Ah, yeah, you're actually uh, making it way older than I, I thought you would say, and I, I, I'll put it, I think, uh, yeah. For me, Lightning is such a, a, a young experiment that, yeah. I, like, it is working now. We cannot say like, Lightning doesn't work anymore. It's gone so much better, not that we have a lot of uh, uh, Lightning service provider coming, but. I find the, the adoption slower than I thought. Maybe it's because I'm from Europe. So how would you say mm -hmm. that the lightning uh, adoption is here in Central America where you're mostly based, right? Yeah, uh, so yeah, we, we focus mainly uh, on the in the global south. So Latin America, Africa. Uh, we do see a lot of interest and we do have customers in you know, US. Europe is very iffy right now. So uh, the MICA regulation has put a lot of damper on, you know, projects and very interesting projects that were going on uh, in Europe. But, you know, we'll see how it shakes out. <laughs> but coming back to your adoption, in terms of adoption, I think uh, what happens is, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the term of induced demand. Mm -hmm. So... It is like that. You, you kind of have to build first, create, you know, this availability, and then the demand will come, right? Kind of like that movie, old movies, build it and they will come. Same principle. And I think uh, right now, the users we have are, it, it lacks about, you know, 12 months, right? So the user we have right now is where the technology was about 12 months ago. And it kind of fits. So I think, you know, while we would like to, you know, make Lightning a success overnight, 
I think it's actually better that, that we're having this route where it's going to be a slow ramp up because when we really do ramp up, we are, our technology has to be much, much better. Yeah, so my problem question would be like, what do you think are the missing steps to really offer like the best product you could uh, to the customer, like maybe technical wise, and then we we'll mm -hmm. move to regulation because you were men mentioning mm -hmm. India and I'm kind of yeah. interesting in front of you. Yeah, so uh, technical is probably going to be the easier of the two, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> just putting it out there. But uh, so technical, I think uh, just, you know, reliability, robustness. Uh, we were just in a class here where they were talking about watchtowers and, so, and lightning factories and all that stuff. So there's like the base functionality is there, right? But the experience is still a little bit behind and we need to be a lot more polished as well from, I'm, I'm gonna say here from the infrastructure side, right? Because you need redundancies, you need uptime, you need uh, monitoring systems to check, you know, that the infrastructure is healthy. You, it, there's still quite a bit that needs to be built. And then looking forward, we still need to bring things like ordinals and uh, stable coins and uh, digital assets into Lightning. So as added functionality. One, once we have that added functionality with the, you know, robustness and kind of like the polish of, of solutions that can be deployed at a massive scale, then we're good. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a long roadmap between, because like you were mentioning like assets, I'm guessing you were also talking about Taro, maybe all in else could do it, uh, RGB. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a lack of, uh, so the infrastructure needs to be built do you see from your point of view, and I'm guessing you do hire engineers or lightning engineers, mm. do you see a shortage of skilled technical people building that infrastructure? Or how do you feel in the space? Uh, well, you know? yeah, I think the space by and large, uh, we need engineers, <laughs> yes. Is uh, there enough in the market? No. No. Well, what you do is you hire just the most talented developers mm -hmm. you can, and they kind of train themselves up okay. on the job. Uh, a lot of this also, you know, because you don't have to bring them straight into Lightning. So if you have a couple of really talented Lightning engineers, you're good. But then you need, you know, DevOps guys, you need backend uh, guys, you need front end people, and UX, UI is gonna be huge in the future, you know, and right now it's very light on UX, UI. Yes, yeah, so actually, you do need to just get the best on the programming side and then you teach them lightning, you teach them Bitcoin, or are you trying to get like Bitcoin enthusiasts that, uh, well, how do you approach that? Uh, obviously we were interested in, in Bitcoiners, but we've, our experience has been that once you explain Bitcoin to a really talented dev, then they become Bitcoiners. <laughs> so. <laughs> We don't really make a lot of differentiation there. Uh, and like I said, right now you kind of don't get too picky because if you find somebody that is really good, you just hire him or her. All right, so I guess what we're doing here with Kuba Plus uh, is the first step toward yeah. mass scaling lightning dev or Taro RGB dev uh, production. It's weird to say production for humans. My English is probably not the best on that word, <laughs> but you get an idea. What about the regulation? Uh, here in El Salvador, it's really open for business. Mm -hmm. They're changing the KYC rules. Uh, mm -hmm. In the opposite, you was mentioning Mika in Europe that is really taking steps forward uh, on the innovation uh, side. Mm -hmm. well, what would you, yeah, what's your take on that? Yeah, uh, well, for one, it's, uh, I think it's, first of all, let me say, I understand where they are coming from do not agree with it, most of it, if any of it. Uh, but I do see where they're coming from. And it's really this, um, you know, kind of uh, wanting to, to implement old, old systems of law to technology that works nothing like 
anything they've seen before. Because mm -hmm. everything we have and everything we do on lightning has no parallel in, in like the previous, like you can make analogies, but it, it's not perfect, right? And so even things like custody get tricky. And so um, it's, I think it's, they need to learn a lot more about the technology to draft intelligent, uh, you know, regulation, which is, I think, something that El Salvador did really well, which was they kept, kept it to a minimum. So they just said, okay, it's gonna be legal tender Bitcoin, and then we'll just adjust you know, to whatever KYC, AML, anything that yeah. is going on right now. But yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's also super challenging for them because uh, like Switzerland and uh, El Salvador, they decided to make something super basic and simple and then everyone can build on top and the regulation are clear and they won't change or they're not too inclusive. Well, in Europe, they're really trying to do like one law for ordinals, one law for NFTs, one law for Bitcoin, and one law is for stable coins. And then it's like really complicated to build products that are multi malleable for all of them. And also that the speed at which our industry is evolving is way too much and way too fast for them to keep up with the law they are building. So yep. yeah, it's like they're trying to, to run on something they don't really get. Yeah, and uh, in the long run, it's just gonna end up hurting them. That's what how I feel about it because the technology is not going to occur. It's going to go to wherever you know it finds the most friendly space, kind of uh, like automobiles, right? They grew up in Europe. Europe came in with all of these sanctions. America was wide open. They said, "Oh, we'll go to America, and that's where we will develop, right?" Because technology wants it. Technology needs it, right? And our regulators are are just shooting themselves on the foot shooting, you know, whatever uh, competitive advantage the countries hold right now, right? They're shooting that down. Um, and then what's even more worrying to me, like for example, something like Mika is, um, what happens with anybody that's under 18? Are you just gonna say anybody that, you know, you're, you're below 18, you can't have access to money? Imagine if, if that was the case, that you want to give your kid five bucks to, to buy a toy uh, or a toy maybe too, <laughs> too small, yeah. but uh, candy, whatever, um, and now you can't. Why? Are you going to do that when everything goes digital? Or are you going to KYC a five-year-old? Are you going to AML a five-year-old? Because that's kind of the choice right now because money's going to get digital. This is not like a question of if, it's a question of when. And it's not too far away right now. So I think, uh, I think we really need to, to re sit down with regulators and, and kind of show them the road they are going down. Now, if they still decide like, no, this is exactly what we want, what we want is to KYC five-year-olds, then they at least should come out and say it. Yeah, and then it's us, our responsibility as people to go and say this is not normal. And mm -hmm. the whole issue is also like custodial. Uh, like, in, 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 like in Mika now, they're going to can't wait to see you to the first cent. Like, if you have a, a POS service in Europe, mm -hmm. you literally cannot do your, ta your job because like every business is going to have to can't wait to see. And then in France, even worse, because if a customer wants to use Bitcoin to buy, like you said, mm -hmm. candy, He's gonna have to pay taxes 30% on the first transaction. Like, it's just law that are not sought for mass adoption of Bitcoin. And I'm wondering, is it not on purpose that they're doing that, especially in Europe, compared to here where they're way more open? Uh, well, I think some of it might be. I think a lot of it might just be ignorance as well. You know, ignorance of the technology, ignorance of why it's important, ignorance of what is is going to enable because it is a transformative technology. People don't fully understand this yet. You know, there's this idea that uh, we, our payment systems are good enough and they are not. Like by far they are not. And our technology, you know, the internet, 
IoT, uh, microservices, uh, streaming services, all of them demand better payment solutions. It's not kind of like, this is not coming out of thin air, just, you know, crazy experiment by tech people. It is because it's, it is solving a real need. It, and, you know, it's going to enable also like very cool things to happen in the future, but, you know, not if we continue to put roadblocks in front of them, you know, from a legal or standpoint. Yeah. So, and um, I always, I travel all of my life, and so I see the difference of how people use money and how people are used to pay based on Europe, Central America, and now mm -hmm. North Africa. How do you adapt your product and how do you try to apply uh, your strategy to this continent? You were mentioning uh, North Africa. Um, yeah. How do you see the payments for them over there? Uh, using Actually, uh, paradoxically, our limitations to deliver technology are not technological. They're purely uh, legal and regulatory. Mm -hmm. So countries with lighter uh, regulatory requirements or legal requirements were able to do a lot better products than in countries that don't, that are more strict. And so, you know, it, it is a sad thing to see how technology is hamstring by, by, you know, regulators, and especially regulators that don't take the time to really study that which we, which they are regulating. And, and I think that's a real shame. And we try to, to reach out to them. We, we sit down with uh, regulators and lawmakers, and we honestly, we don't see them as necessarily the enemy or evil or anything like that. They're, they're also trying to do their job and they have valid points, but, you know, we have to have a conversation about, you know, how do we get this into the hands of people because it is important. Do you see, uh, how do you feel about the response of uh, the Salvadorian government based on, um, probably you've talked with them, right? I'm guessing mm -hmm. you've tried to show them technical knowledge and how it should be done. How do you feel the response is here uh, where we are already? Very positive all around. You know, there's, uh, at the beginning, because we were here since the law passed in 2021, right? And um, we had uh, meetings with, you know, the Ministry of um, Economics, the Economic Ministry, and very curious, very open to learning about the technology. Um, even, you know, and that actually was our first contact with regulators uh, and, and the eye-opening right because a lot of times the what happens in our countries is not even because it's something we want to do or adopt this is all being drafted by you know lawmakers at supranational agencies like FAFCA so people that are not even voted into power and they're making decisions for the whole whole world right and the worst thing is that, you know, somebody in Brussels or Geneva or wherever, you know, suddenly decides like, ah, we need AML compliance. Yeah, sure. And then they pass down like, oh, everybody needs to have like a receipt for, you know, electricity or whatever. And like, good luck going to a village here in El Salvador and asking for a receipt for water, electricity or phone or any utility. like. The road doesn't have a name. So get off your high horse, go out into the world for a second, see you know, the problems that real people face, and adjust. Because right now, you're maybe on purpose, maybe not, but the fact of the matter is that you are keeping over 50% of the population impor impoverished, right? So, yeah, it's crazy. And like you say, I really think it is a question of regulation because we do have the technology. Like Bitcoin is borderless, it's permissionless. Uh, we as a community have done everything to, to make it as accessible to everyone with the fighting so anyone can have a node, anyone can have a wallet. A lot of things are open source. And 
we can fight as long as we want to educate and give them the tools at the end of the day they are the one that could hold the power to just say hey no you're not allowed to download this software you're not allowed to have like this hardware you're not allowed to use that technology uh in a really arbitrary way. yeah and and then it gets into really weird situations right because what happens if you publish the code in a book can you not distribute that book can you not read that book so now we're in the field where we're uh you know um what was it? Um, the freedom of speech, yeah. right? Are we allowed to speak freely or not? We'll have to wait and see. It's crazy. So uh, you were mentioning that uh, you were trying to build something pretty cool in Europe and sadly mm. kind of backed up. Could you tell us a bit what you were uh, aiming? Well, it's, it's pretty much the same things that, that we're doing here, uh, but we feel Europe is really fertile ground for it. And so, for example, uh, we have a merchant payment solution with instant uh, fiat convertibility that we could deploy there. Not really. <laughs> and we have, uh, you know, within the product suite that we have for enterprise grade clients, we have uh, what we call stable accounts or fiat accounts, which just use uh, Bitcoin as kind of a transmission mechanism. Mm -hmm. So you send and receive value over, you know, lightning, which is instant. But whenever the balance is held in an account, it is, you know, stabilized to that currency. So euros, dollars, whatever. And this enables, you know, lightning fast commerce because it could allow, you know, one of the big problems that we have today, this day and age is, how to charge for you know microservices online, and you can consider a news article a microservice, yeah, yeah. right? Now it's behind a paywall that's a subscription model that nobody's gonna pay. But you would pay like two cents or five cents to read an, an article online, or at least I would, and I think the majority of people would. I won't subscribe to your magazine or newspaper or whatever, but I would pay you five cents for the article. And that is a cool project that could be delivered in Europe, but it's not going to. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite sad. And I do agree that, that this new business model that you just talked is obvious to everyone. Like, you're not going to subscribe to something, give information, give your banking information, and then just read an article and then have to cancel it doesn't make any sense. You were mentioning um, your clients and you were saying you want to stay like on this, try to help startups. However, I want to move mm. more to the institutional level stage yeah. because we talked a lot about ATF, BlackRock and the big guys coming in. Yeah. Um, do you see adoption from the biggest player that do need this high liquidity, high services? Yeah. Adoption, not yet, but there's a lot of interest for from you know, traditional finance companies and traditional settlement companies mm -hmm. in the technology. Uh, we've been involved in a couple of RFIs. We're also involved in a couple of POCs. So RFI, request for information, POC, uh, proof of concepts. And so they're in the lab phase at that level right now. But I think that once they see all of the value add, they're going to move quick. And this technology is going to come very fast. Do you think uh, we are missing a big one for them to realize, or do we think it's more like the technique, the, the tools are not here yet? Uh, the tools are kind of here, but right now they need to get comfortable with yeah. them, right? So that's exactly what the POCs are going to do. I think in this particular use case, the price of Bitcoin is going to be largely irrelevant because when you're using it just as a settlement and a mechanism yeah, you're, you're stable. instantly in and out right and you're stable uh, interesting interesting um so there's a lot of potential for the youth to get into that technology it's yeah uh, like you said 10 years old or 12 years old it's a long road ahead yeah no it's a it, it's very exciting i think like i said it, it's gonna really change the way we do things the way we interact and at a commercial level and at a global level so I'm very excited about that. Do you see, uh, I'm just curious because I, since you are 
everywhere. Are you actually in Asia or all the eastern part of the world? I know I'm not. I'm <laughs> if you get info for all of us here. N uh, not yet. We have conversations with, let's say, uh, companies like Neutron Pay that are doing the same thing in, in Asia. Uh, EMEA, like, so, sorry, the Mid Middle East is also another region that is still kind of difficult for us to touch. A lot of it stems from uncertainty, from, you know, the minute we offer our services, let's say in a place like Iran, Iraq, like what does that do to all of our operation? And because we are, you know, fully licensed and we have to comply and we do the whole regulatory thing, right? Um, there are places we just cannot go to. Would you say that all the regulatory um, paperwork is <laughs> one of the biggest uh, hurdles that you have as a business owner and business uh, creator? Um, definitely one of the bigger costs, yeah. yeah. About as big as, as the tech part. Um, that's, uh, that's a big cost because <laughs> usually like being dev, I'm not cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, you know, it is what it is. I think for most financial institutions as well, in that sense, w we, we have started to see a lot of pain from our customers, right? Because they have the same thing we have. Like they have whole legal teams, not because they want to, but because it's imposed by, to them by law, right? And so right now there's a lot of inefficiencies in the system, in the financial system. And a lot of it is just artificially created by lawmakers. Uh, I do want to tackle you on a, on a subject and be a bit uh, mm -hmm. badly here. You always, uh, we often say that Bitcoin is a crew money kind of, and as it's permissionless, and we don't need to ask for permission, yep. and shouldn't be regulated, and there's a whole bunch of Bitcoin and what are more extreme. Mm -hmm. um, you are on the more regulatory side. How mm -hmm. do you feel like the, the battle will play out between people that just don't want to respect, and actually the people that do respect as an adoption? Do you see... Um, you know what I mean? the, yeah, I, I know what you mean, and it's something that I've given a lot of thought to. So just to be clear, uh, I'm not pro-regulation in the sense that I personally, I don't think it should exist. Mm -hmm. uh, I comply with all regulation yeah. because, <laughs> because <laughs> you have to, right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean I agree with it. What I do think is that the way to change it is not necessarily by going head to head. The way to change it is by engaging in conversation and getting to a point where they can also see the other side of the coin. Because right now, they're only seeing one side, which is you know, uh, the danger of criminals using money, yeah. right? But what they don't see is that the regulation, that very small subsection of the population, because it's, you know, it's not that high, by targeting them, you're basically condemning to poverty 50% of the population. So what is the cost? And B, you know, is it the only way to tackle this problem? Like, is, is KYC AML the right way to go after criminals? I would argue it's not, because you cannot weaponize your ultimate agent for peace, which is money. The moment you weaponize that agent for peace, it destroys its whole purpose. And now we're in a very violent situation back again because we ran out of the way to make peace, which is engaging in commerce. So it's, it's a philosophical debate. It's not going to be settled anytime soon, I know. And, but it is worth starting to have those conversations, you know. No, I think, it, I think you're right. So something super interesting I find is like if we can do a parallel with, uh, with paid GP that uh, at the beginning was considered as a weapon for enc an encryption mm -hmm. and then at some point the banking system realized how they could use it and how it could actually save them uh, money, help their clients and then they started doing some lobby at the state's level saying hey actually you know what that technology is cool let's make it usable and maybe like you were saying on the settlement layer if big institutions start using Bitcoin and lightning correctly and they realize mm -hmm. the saving that is possible 
the, the market penetration to a whole new class of population that is possible, they mm. will feel like there's an interest to actually mm -hmm. make easier regulation to penetrate that market and do more business. Yeah. So at some point, they will also help us. Yeah, and here's the very interesting part about all of this, which is one of the things that uh, I'm having conversations about, which is uh, right now, our payment system works in such a manner that it's basically batch transactions, right? So you aggregate as many payments as you can to send out one big payment because that's more efficient, right? But Lightning turns that on its head. Yeah. In Lightning, it's more efficient the smaller you go, right? Yeah, because you can go through any route. Yeah. yeah. And you can go through any route, so it makes it more efficient. And then you can also, th there's a bunch of advantages to it. You channel bandwidth, all, all kinds of stuff, right? So now we're moving from a place where you want to create huge payments to a place where you want to actually create micro payments. And by making micro payments and everything smaller, you completely de-risk the operation, right? And not only from the, uh, you know, uh, uh, technological standpoint, but also from the regulatory standpoint, because you're not going to be laundering at five bucks a transaction, right? So the idea for me, and, and it's a change, it's a real change of paradigm, right? Because we're moving from one world to the other. And just like, you know, in the beginning of the 80s, every, most computer transactions were batched. They were batched transactions when we moved to the microprocessor and it turned out it was better to do transactions in real time, well, what's gonna happen when we move to real time financial transactions? And the you know, ocean of commercial opportunities that's gonna be available for us when that happens. And we can, we can only speculate right now, but we need to get to that place. Yeah, no, it's actually crazy. Like the, the, the SPAC became stream SAT. That's what we call it to our students, streaming SAT. If you want to do just an easy example, download Fontaine apps and you can start streaming SAT to, to your podcaster, to usually the, the tutorials we teach you in the class. Really show the power of it uh, because then if you need to do a repayment on your house, uh, if you just have the interest rate changing, it can change on a minute basis and your payment will be adapted as it goes. And so like you said, the risk is gonna be decreased, so the insurance world is gonna change because when they understand the technology, and then with multi-sig and clustered, we can even imagine that there is no liability on uh, other entities. So the fact that your money is held by a bank is also no, an extra risk that can yeah. be removed. And with zero knowledge proof, you can even increase that, uh, you can even remove that risk even more. So it's really gonna, change the institution in the world and i'm not sure they're quite ready like you were saying 10 years <laughs> old when are they going to get it like when are they going to take the switch well i think it's going to be gradual you know not everybody gets it at the same time right but uh if we take uh you know the internet as an example i think the more forward-thinking companies started adopting it really into their whole infrastructure and into their whole corporation mid 90s yeah. and the late comers and the guys that were late to the party ended up like in 2010 <laughs> but you know so would we say that today we are like in the infrastructure creation phase of bitcoin yeah or, yeah. yeah i would say that we're right now so so for example this is uh, a really interesting thought experiment. So you think of things like to scale in la layers, yeah. right? Technology likes to scale in la layers and monetary technology is no different. And so the first layer, you needed it to do one thing, which is be become a really good store of value. And so everything that got done at the base layer in Bitcoin, so layer one, was uh, geared towards that, as it should be. But now, you know, if, if we actually want to become money, we need the second layer, where, is, where we become, you know, a transactional currency, right? Mm -hmm. Where we can actually move money around. And that's what we're building on Lightning, right? And beyond that is when we get to a money, uh, sorry, to a unit of account, that's probably either gonna be on a third layer or as a 
subservice of layer two. Mm -hmm. and, and that is going to, like I said, change things. Yeah, definitely. And, um, oh, you know, we always talk about layer, like you just said, and even privacy can be ob obtained on, on a sub layer with like 10 million dollars of federating system yeah. or like batching uh, companies joining forces to have their mm -hmm. own ecosystem. And then the code is open source, everyone is going to build on it as long as you respect the rules of the protocol, which is underneath, uh, whether it's Lightning or whichever implementation you want, or Bitcoin. I mean, you can do it technically and then respect the regulation if you want to do business in your country and, and you're good to go, um, which is actually yeah. crazy. Yeah, and that's the thing. You don't need it to be, let's say, perfect. And there are actually situations where you want a custodial service because custodial services can do things that you as an individual yeah. cannot, right? Like the same reason why you don't probably don't host your email. But as long as you have like the, let's say your savings on chain uh, agnostic, and then your checking account, you know, lightning hosted by anybody, it may be even your own bank, right? When they adopt lightning technology, you send your satoshis there or your funds there. No, no sure. Cause at the end of the day, you're, not everyone is going to open this channel. It doesn't make any sense. So you're going to yeah. use services that do that for you. Not everyone is going to watch over the network, have his watch over, like we're saying, mm -hmm. and have the best user experience. So custodial uh, services do offer that, especially for newcomers. They're just not going to, they're not going to install Zeus, you know, <laughs> they're just going to use yeah. a better solution. And even for POS, you can imagine like a really easy onboarding solution for merchant. And then once a week, once a month, the money is sent directly to their non-custodial wallet. No, that's the beautiful thing about this because it's programmable and I see where you're going, but I'm, we're taking it one step further and this should be done pretty quickly is uh, we can have our merchant payment solution just streaming sats to the merchant in real time as they come in. Like, and, and eliminate con completely the custodial part of being a merchant processor. You're just providing the easiest, better, best tool to, you know, charge for money, charge for products and services. Yeah, and so, sorry, so, so for, for some of the people that do know us, um, in Switzerland, there's a, a payment processor called Swiss Bitcoin Pay, and because they have the Swiss regulation, they are not considered custodial for some time. So they can just mm -hmm. not care we see, they get the, uh, the money from the clients, and every morning at 3 a.m. they send it uh, mm -hmm. batching directly to their own channels. I do definitely agree, they could just do lightning if they were big, bigger, better, and, and more structured. But it really shows, and I, I go back to the regulation issue we talked before, the arbitrage that will be done by companies based on where they are, because that services is possible here in El Salvador. It's possible in Switzerland. It's yeah. not possible in Europe. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and it's the same because I have to tell people to move away from my country just because we can well, do this. No, here's the thing, right? So this is very interesting. Uh, it, it gets into the nuance of yeah, the law, of right? But I don't know how this is going to shake out. But apparently, MICA applies if you do any sort of publicity or you target European customers yeah, directly. Yeah. But if customers find you like okay. by accident or whatever, then they can, you can actually deliver your service to them. So how is that gonna work? Yeah, no, it, I don't know. It's, pretty it's a globalized world. <laughs> I know, it's a, it's a spirit thing. Um, yeah. We've been talking about startups, you want to serve them, we've talked yeah. about a lot of technical. Would you have any advice for all the youth that are getting into Bitcoin, are hesitating to start a business, join one? What could you uh, give as a piece of advice for the people that do want to start a business here? Start a business? Let's start, let's start <laughs> with like, work on Bitcoin, let's be brother, well, just work Bitcoin. on Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, I would say, honestly, start using it that that would be the first thing like use it as much as you can like uh download a, a lightning wallet but also get you know build a hardware wallet get to know the technology um you know make a paper wallet never use it don't use it please <laughs> but build but make it just so you know what's going on and uh 
and interact with the technology, I think that's, that's a good first step. Now, if they want to go deeper after that, you know, <clears throat> read a lot about uh, money as a technology. And don't equate money with currency. So a lot of us think, you know, dollars, euros, uh, quetzales, uh, whatever, that's money. That is not money. That's currency. Currency can have monetary properties, but it's not money. So do a deep dive into what money is, why we use it, why it's necessary. When I say money is the ultimate tool for peace, don't take it for granted. Ask why is he saying that, right? And deep dive into it. See if I'm, check, check if I'm right. Don't trust, but be very fine. <clears throat> yeah, and, and once you start, you know, learning about money and learning about this tool and why it's important, then, you know, you're, you, everybody will probably have their own road to walk. Yes, no, definitely. You were talking about uh, money, and uh, there's a question I like to add to almost everyone, because I think it's mm -hmm. one of the most important thing in the, the next 10 years. It's about uh, your take on CBDCs, and uh, where do you see that uh, going? Well, that's actually why we started uh, Bitcoin, because to me, the threat of CBDCs, or not even CBDCs, let's call it, uh, a digital currency, you know, um, controlled by a central authority, scares me so much that we need a decentralized, agnostic money alternative. The other one is just like really, really bad. And I'm not even, uh, you know, saying uh, it's so prone to human error. Like, somebody misreads your name, you know, and they can shut you out, flipping a switch from the whole economy. How are you going to prove that it wasn't you? How are you going to pay a lawyer? How are you going to buy a cup of coffee? How are you going to feed your kids if you can just get shut down? Because it will happen. And... It might be a mistake. What happens with identity theft? Did that just suddenly go away? And now you can't do anything because your identity got stolen. Yeah. It's, uh, it's crazy to think that it's so logical. Maybe it's because we've studied it for five, 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 five times an hour and we've been in it for like well, <laughs> so long in the industry. For, but. for me, it was not something that I, ha I even had to study. This is the reality for, let's say, 80, 90% of the world. That's not privileged to live in, you know, the global north. Everybody else knows this problems happen, and it happens daily, every time. Yeah, and the CBDC, I'm just going to make it stronger, because at the end of the day, if, if we think about it, uh, most bank accounts today can be frozen. They do trace your things. You don't have much privacy on the financial system. But the CBDC is really going to empower them even more and make the thing way more drastic and better. Yeah, what happens is that right now, let's say you get your account frozen, but you have, you know, social network. Not, not in the social media network, but in a social, like you have friends, family, whatever, and they all come in, they pitch in, they get, uh, you know, cash out, so they give you money, but they give it to you cash, mm -hmm. and you're able to feed your family, and you're able to pay for your uh, defense attorney, and you, you're able to, you know, combat against the system when you were, you know, unjustly uh, charged, mm -hmm. right? In a CBDC world or in a digital currency-only world, what happens is nobody can help you. It's, um, it's threatening, and we actually saw it uh, with the Troy Canadian Trucker recently, how they managed to try everyone that gave money to that political uh, cause or uh, regroupment of people to manifest against something which was in their right. And then it was like, all right, well, you help them, let's freeze your bank account, and let's do it on a large scale for everyone that was at that manifestation. And just the fact that they can do that, and they, they did it, 
is actually crazy. And now the fact that they are moving the law with Mika to do it on a larger scale is even crazier. And the fact that the solution is to use the tools and go talk to your politician, do lobby, go talk to your community, educate your friends and family about Bitcoin and the, and the solution, the alternative. So at the end of the day, in five years, two years, whatever, when they really try to push the law to get it adopted, we are here standing and saying like, no, this is bullshit. Like we actually do need freedom of speech and sending payment using the money like we want is basic freedom of speech. Money is speech. Don't forget. And yeah. Uh, and yeah, and that's the thing. I, I like how you phrased it. We got to engage at, you know, the grassroots political level because remember, even though it might seem like DC is far away or Brussels or Paris or whatever, they still have to respond to the needs of the population. We just have been silent for too long and we have to stand up for ourselves and demand our freedoms. Freedoms are not going to be given. They're going to be taken from. And so that's the thing. And remember always, I, I always say this, and this is why I like Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is the ultimate uh, test of responsibility, right? At least on-chain. If you have on-chain Bitcoin, it's the ultimate test of your ability to be responsible and care for your own monetary future. And the reason why this is important is because responsibility is the price of freedom. The mo that's how it is. So. I'll phrase it a different way. You pay for your freedom by being responsible. The more you assume responsibility for your own actions, the more you assume responsibility for what goes on in your life, the more freedom you will have. And the more you give this responsibility away, like, and you say, no government, take care of my health care. No government, take care of my retirement no government, you have to take care of this. That is the freedom you're sacrificing. Amen. Like, honestly, it, it is just, you can do it. Honestly, you can do it. You just need to get started, write 12 work, try some transaction, delete the wallet, do it again, slowly by slowly. And you don't have to do everything at once. That's what I'm telling my students all the time. Yeah. Uh, we try to help them from like Bitcoin 101 and then it's like lightning to one theory and then practice. You don't need to straight up be with like a seed signer on OTSIG with some sort of uh, resistance back. You're never gonna make it. You start with a single wallet, move to a cold wallet, con take your node, get control of the consensus you're running and connect your node to your wallet and then start experimenting with a uh, you know, TC, and then one day you will say, all right, now uh, I'm tired of using like custodial lightning solution. Let's start to have my first lightning node. And you try it. And slowly by slowly, Bitcoin is a process. And at some point, it's okay to stop. Like you, mm. there's a certain level where you have enough freedom or enough, you've done enough. But uh, don't try to do everything at once. Just know it's a, it's a journey. And even if you just start after the first year and you just have your private key and an inheritance plan and you know how to secure your wealth, you are already like ahead of 99% of the people now. So it's yeah. good to you. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Jose, thank you uh, so much. Maybe um, do you want to, to say like one last thing for, for, for the youth or for like, uh, I don't know, if you, if you have any last word for the community, uh, it's up to you. And if not, where can they find you? Um, last words is uh, there's a lot of education out there. Don't believe that you have to be, you know, go to a you know, traditional educational institution. In fact, in this space, there aren't even courses you can take. So if it's interesting to you, uh, there's a wealth of information online. Uh, do study a lot on what is money. I think that's a great part. So they, this is you know, the one thing we use daily in all our lives. It is you know, the representation of our energy and we don't care about it. <laughs> That's the wrong way to go about life. You have to care about how you're going to keep your energy safe and secure. And then where can they find me? Uh, you know, Twitter at JL 
O E M U S, uh, at Powered by Ibex, at Ibex Pay for those who want to, you know, uh, try out a merchant payment solution. And uh, the same handles, but dot, dot .io uh, for websites. And you have it, we will have all the links in the description. Don't forget to like, share the video around you. If you have any comment for Jose, just put it in the description. Again, I cannot guarantee we'll read them, <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> if you have questions, maybe we'll answer them. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It was a really interesting conversation, and uh, I wish you good luck. Well, thank you for having me. It was great.